good to see everybody. Let's get in the teaching. You ready to get in the Word tonight? Go with me to Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4. Sydney, what are you doing? Where are you going? Sydney, what are you? Sydney, I said I wasn't taking up offering till end of service. You don't have to run yet. <laughs> they see. Anyway, Genesis chapter 4, starting at verse 1. I've got a teaching, some things that's been on my mind, and um, I, you know you know me. I don't know if we'll finish it tonight, um, but, but we're going to start on it. I've, I've called this uh, time and focus, basically time and focus, and I want to talk around Genesis chapter 4 a little bit, uh, starting at verse 1. The Bible says, now Adam knew his wife, and that word knew there means an intimate way. Uh, knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, uh, I have inquired a man from the Lord. I have acquired a man from the Lord. Verse 2, then she bore again. This time his brother was Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. This is very, very important, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Verse 3, and in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground, uh, to the Lord. Now, an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord was basically produce. Does that make sense to you? Uh, it was out of a garden, basically produce. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock. So we have, uh, I know I'm teaching a little bit here, and we're going to pray, but we have um, uh, Cain that brought an offering to God that came out of his garden. Okay, like, I don't know, but it might have been lettuce and tomatoes and BLTs. I don't know what he was doing. Um, okay, so, but, but uh, Abel uh, brought a lamb. Okay, Abel brought a lamb, um, a flock after uh, the firstborn of the flock um, uh, of their of their fat. So I guess they were fat lambs. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering. The Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. Verse 6 says, so the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your countenance fallen? Um, so the look on his face was, when you study out, it means he was just sad and he was heavy and he was angry. It means to be heavy with anger and just sad. Um, and here's what God is saying to Cain. If you do well, will you not be accepted? So here Cain has a choice. Everybody say choice. Here Cain has a choice. And if you do not do well, sin, because God knew, was about, knew what was about to happen, sin lies at the door and its desire is for you. But you should rule over it. Did you catch that? But you should rule over it. Verse 8, now Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. Pray with me. Father, thank you tonight for your word. I thank you tonight for your knowledge, tonight for your knowledge, your wisdom, your understanding. But above all, thank you for your grace. Your grace, God, that, that is just so, so, so awesome. Your mercy, your kindness, your sympathy, your understanding for our lives. Thank you. And God, it's by your grace that we live, that we walk, that we talk, that we breathe. And it's by your grace that I am who I am. And uh, we just honor you tonight. Speak to us to new levels and get our, our brains and our, our, you know, our vision and our hearing to new levels that we can become everything you've called us to be. Give us more hope than we could ever imagine, more faith than we could ever carry. And we'll give you the glory for it anyhow in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. The uh, reason why I talk to you about Cain and Abel is I want to talk about some things around time and focus some things around time and focus i may get back to that scripture i'm going to do my best to well yeah i'm just going to do it now is that okay um cain brought something to god that it was basically produce it's not that he wasn't trying he was trying to give something to god but god rejected it but god accepted abel's sacrifice now the difference between Abel's sacrifice and Cain's sacrifice is that Abel's sacrifice came by something. It was a lamb, so it was something that was birthed. So catch that. It was something that was birthed. It had to do with blood and water. And actually, it was a prophetic picture of Jesus. If you think about it, it was a prophetic picture of Jesus. God didn't accept Cain's uh, offering because it was produce. Uh God will never really accept things that we can just produce out of our flesh because you, you can't work for something into, you can't work your way into God's grace. So what God wants is something that is birthed on the inside of you. 
And, and guys, when joy and faith and hope and the power of the Holy Spirit is birthed on the inside of you, you don't have to fake anything. You're confident in who you are in Christ because it's been birthed on the inside of you. If you fake it, it's something that you can produce and it won't keep you. Does that make sense to you? It won't keep you. So it all comes down to relationship with Jesus. And Cain had a choice. When he came to a challenge in his life, he had a choice. He could, he could have focused on what was right. Because God said, look, why are you angry and why are you upset? You know, if, if you do the right thing, I'm going to bless you. Okay, but if you don't, sin's like right at your door. It's going to take you out. It's going to cause some major problems. So Cain had a choice. Okay, but the choice he made was to follow what his focus was on. He couldn't get over his jealousy of Cain. So it was a soulish, carnal, carnal issue. He couldn't get over his jealousy. So what happened was it led to murder. And he, he, killed, he killed his brother over it. So what's that got to do with us today in the year 2013? Well, touch your neighbor and say, get ready. <laughs> get ready. I want to talk to you a little bit tonight about time and focus. Time in your life is the most precious commodity. Time is the most precious commodity in your life. If you think about it, it is the currency of destiny. Now, as I'm preaching this and teaching this, you've got to understand destiny. You've got to understand destiny. Destiny is a, is a God-given destiny. It is a predetermined path that God has set up for your life. Does that make sense to you? It's a predetermined path that God has set up for your life. It is your destiny, okay? Uh, this church, if you don't want, uh, you guys, you are my destiny because God called me to start this church and pastor this church. This church is my destiny. I'm doing my destiny. Does that make sense to you? I'm in it. I'm, I'm doing my destiny. Uh, so, so, Time in my life is the most precious commodity to me. It, it's how we help. It, it's how you help yourself number your days and how you use your time. Listen, how you use your time, how we use our time determines whether or not if we will fulfill our destiny. How we use our time will determine whether or not that we will fulfill our destiny or be fulfilled with our destiny. Does that make sense to you? There's a lot of people out there that are not fulfilled, and they're not fulfilled because they don't understand their purpose. And if you don't understand your purpose, you will never be fulfilled, and you will never find fulfillment. And you will go here to find it. You will go here to find it. You'll go for this drug to cover the pain. You'll go for this alcohol to cover it up. You'll go for this hobby. You'll go for this thing. You'll go for this thing, and it will never, ever fulfill you. It just won't until you understand what your purpose is and why you're alive. Okay, I don't know else how to do this, uh, so I'm just going to say what I say. It's just, you all know me, some of you. Those of you that don't know me, just pray for me. Um, here's the deal. Forget your job. Forget your family. Forget your dreams. Forget religion. Forget denomination. Forget all that. Forget what you've been involved in. Just for a moment, you go back to it because it's life. We can't escape it. Okay. Go to Gatlinburg in a couple weeks, whatever you want to do. But right now, just forget about all that. You were created for a reason. My parents, God used my parents as a vehicle to get Kelly Floyd here. Whatever your relationship is with y'all's parents, y'all, I'm in Kentucky, I can say that. Out in Reno, they made fun of me. But whatever relationship is, it is what it is. God used that vehicle. That's how he uses to get you here. So you're not by yourself in it, but yet that's how you got here. So there's a reason why you're alive. And the reason why you're alive goes beyond a career or 401K and college and high school and girlfriends and boyfriends and husbands and divorce. And it, it, goes all, uh, it goes way above that. The reason why you're here is for purpose. You are here because God designed you and destined, destined you to be alive at this time. Why? Everybody okay? Lauren, you look, gosh, Lauren's like, that's okay. You are focused. That's good. You need to be focused. We're going to talk about that. Yeah? So you will never find fulfillment in your life until you find your purpose in life. Yeah? We really are here. You want to know why you're here, why you're alive? You are really alive here to do what Jesus started, and that is the Great Commission. To go to every nation, 
our nationality and proclaim the gospel, which means the good news of Jesus Christ. If you want, if you want to make it, you know, sound biblical, that, that I mean, it is biblical, but that's the truth. You're here to help help God proclaim the gospel. You're here to be His hands, His feet, and His mouthpiece. Now, you can go on vacation and you can work a job and make a lot of money. Don't forget to tithe. But you can, you can do all that stuff. But I'm telling you, the reason why that we are all here is because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why we're alive. Amen. Come on, everybody say amen. Help me feel good. Yeah? So with all that said, there's so many things in life, I believe, that sidetrack us from really doing our destiny, not just having a destiny. We've got to get beyond the thinking of, I have a destiny. No, you need to start doing your destiny. There needs to come a time in your life where you need to start doing your destiny. There's a season where God opens up the gate and says, okay, I know you don't know where you're headed, but you're just going to have to be like Abraham, and you're just going to have to start walking. We want the whole package to look good. Well, the package don't always look good. You don't even know sometimes what you're walking into. That's why it's called, come on, everybody say faith. Yeah, so there's a lot of things that can, can, can cause us from not doing our destiny. And then there's a lot of things why we're doing our destiny that can cause us to not enjoy doing our destiny. The Christian life should be one of the best lives that we could live. The problem is, is I think that we're all carnal, and, I th and including myself, and we're all soulish, and we're so wrapped up in me, myself, and I, we're struggling just to have joy. And there's something wrong with the body of Christ today. And I don't mean to be judgmental because I'm in the cave. Let me move on. Everybody okay? You're like, cave? I thought we were in church. Just, just okay. It's all right. Hold on. There's so many things that can distract us. So many things that just steal not only our focus, but steal our joy. Okay, I'm here in the cave. I'm trying to follow my notes and be good. David, and some of you know this story, David, before he was already anointed king, but he wasn't king yet, and he was running from King Saul. King Saul was trying to kill him, okay? So David had a bunch of mighty men, but the problem is, at this moment, uh, David and all of his supposedly mighty men were all broke. Their families were basically destroyed. They didn't have much left, and they found themselves without lands and without homes, and they found themselves in a cave hiding from the king. And they were broke. They had no money. They had nothing. Uh, they didn't really even have any water. And David said, if you read the story, I would just, it, I'm going to paraphrase. He probably didn't say it like this. He mean, I would kill somebody if they would do, I would kill for a drink of water right now. Somebody go get me a Mountain Dew. It's 7-Eleven or they don't have 7-Elevens in Kentucky. But um, so, somebody go get me a drink. And his mighty men went behind enemy lines to the fountain and got him a drink of water and brought it to him. And I'm telling you, this would have ticked me off. And then David poured it out and said, oh, I'm not worthy. I'm like, really? I just risked my life for you, and you're saying you ain't worthy? Well, you could at least gave it to me. You, you, you know what I'm talking about. So they were all messed up. I mean, they, they were all messed up, and they were all broke, and they were in the cave. Now, we all find ourselves in that cave. I find myself in that same cave. Jamie, we're inside. I'm broke. There's broken things on the inside of this man, and I find myself in the cave. Okay? But you know what? My dad could be in that cave. John can be in that cave. Kayla could be in that cave. Chris could be in that cave. Jamie, we're all in this together. Come on, say together. So we're all in this together, so I'm in the cave. But what I can't allow myself to do is adjust to it. Hold on. I'm getting good now. I got to do walk. I got to do the walk. I can't allow my eyes to adjust. Because see, when you get up in the middle of the night in your house, you're used to the dark. There's a little bit of light coming in from the window, and you know where you're surrounding, so you feel your way to the bathroom, or you feel your way to the refrigerator that you don't want anybody to know what you're doing, and you feel your way. Yeah, I know what y'all do. We all do it. Where's the Twinkies? Do they still make those? And so you, 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 you they're bringing them back in Jesus' name, God. Okay, so, so you're feeling your way around. The danger is when you do that in the cave, if you let your eyes adjust, you will not leave it. And if you don't leave the cave, you'll never be able to do your destiny. I said, if you don't leave the cave, you will never be able to do your destiny. So things tra trap us in the cave, and we get used to the fear. We get used to the dysfunction. We get used to not having any peace. Our eyes adjust because there's not enough light. Don't ever let your eyes get adjusted to the cave. You need light. Light represents revelation. 
You need the light. Go to the light. Go to the light. Go to the light. You need, I don't know what that was, but it was funny. You need to go to the light. Don't let your eyes adjust because when you move and make, and sometimes you got to make yourself move. I don't want to. How many many's ever been in the dark for a while and you turn the light on? You're like, oh, God. It's uncomfortable. But if you give yourself some time, your eyes will adjust to the light just like your eyes adjust to the dark. And your eyes need to adjust to the light. Your eyes need to adjust to the revelation. Come on, say revelation. Your eyes need to adjust to the revelation. And sometimes you have to make yourself move. The cool thing about David and his mighty men is all they were all broke and hurting. They came together and they did wonderful things. They built a wonderful nation of Israel. They did great things and many battles were won. There was a lot of hardship and a lot of problems. They walked through problems together. Those same mighty men that would risk their life for David and Ziglag, they wanted to kill him. Same men. They were all tired. Yeah, I love David. Oh, one of these days, I'm, we're going to preach about David. And do a, would you guys like that? Do a study on David together. David wasn't a priest, but I believe that David had a revelation of grace. And David had a revelation of Jesus Christ before he, he, you know, the Bethlehem story ever happened. David picked up at Ziglag, picked up the ephod, and acquired of the Lord. That wasn't his place to do that. That was the priest deal. But God spoke to him. He said, Go ahead and overtake. You will recover all and then some. Sometimes you just got to make yourself do what yourself doesn't want to do. Amen. Amen. So they did something great together. Amen. So if they let their focus stay on their issues, they would have never, ever left the cave. Yeah, they would have never, ever left the cave. So light is revelation. Uh, when you're in the cave, the light becomes dim, and the light's not as bright. But light is revelation, light is grace, light, I'm, I'm like, why can't I read? I, it's because my glasses are not on. You can't let your eyes adjust, you have to make yourself move. The first question that I ask myself, and I've taught this before, it's just been a while. The first question that we must ask ourselves is this, is what is my focus? I've got four levels of focus I want to talk to you about tonight. It's been a while since I've taught this, but we're going to talk around this for a little bit. Uh, we might finish it tonight. The focus of infancy is survival. The focus of infancy is survival. Um, if a baby is not taken care of, it will die. If the baby is not fed by someone, it will die. If the baby is not cleaned and taken care of, it will get sick, it will have disease, and it will eventually die. So the focus of infancy is survival. I need this to survive. I need this to survive. Are you following me? I need this to survive. So the focus of infancy is survival. And I say focus because we must understand that whatever we focus on, number one, will get bigger. And we will lean to the area that we're focusing on more than anything else. So in my life is the focus of my life right now in an infant state. Is my focus surviving? Just follow me. Just trying to make you think. Number two, the focus of childhood is learning. Some, some little kids, when they're like one and two, you think their name is no. <laughs> I remember when I was, uh, Mom, I don't remember how old I was, but uh, I saw this red, beautiful light on the stove. Remember that? And I'm, I don't know, how, how old was I? 16, 17? I'm just kidding. How old was I? Was I like two or three? Oh, wow. Good memory. And there's a reason why I remember it. So I was like, <laughs> it's really stupid. I was a really dumb kid. But I'm like, wow, look at that glow. I want to touch the glow. I just want to touch. It was, it was like Kayla's hair. And I was like, wow. And so I just, I don't want to touch the glow. And so I just went, and burnt my hand. Like, that's really all I remember. I probably blacked out or something. But I just, but, oh, Mom, just follow with me. Just, come on. That's what pastors do. We exaggerate. We exaggerate. Play the game. Okay. So, but I remember I put my hand on that burner, and it was hot. 
and it burnt. And I was like, ah, I just burnt my hand. So the focus of childhood is learning. Don't touch that. Don't do that. Don't put that down. You know, no, don't run out into the street. Okay, so the focus of childhood is learning. No, you can't do that because you're going to get hurt. Does that make sense to you? So it's it's learning what to do and learning what not to do. And, and then, then we have the focus of adolescence, which is teenage years. I've been there. We've all been there. Some of you are there. The, teen, the, the focus of adolescence is always self. What about me? What about my dreams? What about my money? We'll get a job. Maybe you'll have some. What about this? And what about that? What about me? 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 That's the focus of adolescence. You're all looking at me like oh, you just lost your best friend. I mean, that's the truth. I was there. We, we've been there. And that's the seasons that we go through. The, so the focus of adolescence, which is teenage years, is always about self. It's hardly ever about anybody else. The last focus I want to talk about, I'm going to go through these again, is maturity. Everybody say maturity. The focus of maturity is always reproduction. The focus of maturity is reproduction. I need to reproduce what God has put in me. I need to reproduce what I have learned. Okay, God told Adam, reproduce and then multiply what I put on the inside of you. The potential, Adam, that I placed on the inside of you, I want you to reproduce that out in the natural, and then I want you to multiply to that. Okay, add to it, multiply, add to your gift, add to your gift. The focus of maturity is reproduction. Now, I've been, uh, I went through many, many, many years of serving other pastors and many years of, of you know, uh, being in church and, and working in, in ministry and music and a lot of music area. I've worked in children's department. I've, I've ushered, uh, I've greeted at the door when I had to. Uh, I've cleaned the toilets and uh, I was uh, uh, pastors. Uh, I've been an armor bearer. For some of you who don't know what that is, an armor bearer comes uh, basically. David was Saul's armor bearer at one time. And what you do for the man of God in your life is is you you learn from him. And armor bearing is uh, like I used to carry my pastor's Bible for him when we were out, and I would I would make sure he had what he needed because I was serving him. It's, it's kind of what Elisha did to Elijah. He just served the man of God for seven to twelve years. Just served him. He was known as the one who washed the prophet's hands. That's all he did. He served him. Is, is it because my pastor is something special? Well, he really is. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, it's not because there's something special, there's, but there's a principle of learning. That's why sometimes you'll see me, with, I'll, I'll have certain people by me, and uh, I can't do that with everybody because I don't have enough brain space, but um, yeah, that I'm, wasn't a bad thing. Um, so, but, you know, I, I, I've served my pastors in the past. When, the, when I have guests in, I serve them, make sure they got water, make sure they got a nice hotel room. I make sure that they're taken care of. And I ask, can I carry your, your books for you? Can I carry your computer? What, whatever you need. Because I'm armor bearing. And, and there's, there's, a, there's a whole teaching on armor bearing. But I've done that as well. And within that, in every season of my life, because the Bible says, if you are faithful in another man's field, God will give you a field of your own. That doesn't mean you'll pastor somewhere. But what that means is if you can be faithful here, God will give you enough to have your own thing here because you were faithful here. If you can't be faithful with what belongs to somebody else, how can you be faithful if God hands you over something? If you can't be committed in this season, how are you going to be committed in this season? If you want to grow and do great things to God, but you can't be faithful here, then God ain't going to move you forward. you got to stay committed to the season that God has you in. But you need to understand what season that is. If you don't understand what season that is, it will cause you to be confused and stay confused and will steal your joy and steal your focus. So, speaking of focus, the, the focus of infancy is survival. And I'm just going to throw some things out here to make you think. There's no guilt tonight. There's no condemnation. These are the things that I ask myself to keep myself in a boundary and keep myself sharp and to keep myself in the lane. It's called responsibility. Don't everybody say Responsibility. The season that I am in, is it a season where I'm focusing on survival? Sometimes we find ourselves in those seasons where we feel like we're just trying to survive. Well, if I'm in survival mode, I'm in an infancy state. And sometimes you find yourself there, and I don't care how long you've been a Christian, there's sometimes I find myself in that state. But it's like the cave. I might find myself in that survival focus mode, but I can't stay there. 
Because if I'm always trying to survive, Chris, I'm going to get tired. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. We're all there. And, and I go through seasons where I'm in that state. Okay, so I can't stay in survival mode. I will get tired and I will want to quit constantly. So am I in a survival state? Am I in a learning season? And learning seasons are good if you can recognize them for what they are. Most of the time, you don't recognize them as a learning season until you're already through the season. And you think, I ain't going to last through the season. Then you find, you find yourself on the other side, and you look back, and you see what you've learned. But what if you could be in that season and realize, hey, it's in a learning season. When you realize you're in a learning season, you realize you trust the one who put you in that season. If you can trust the one who put you in that season, you're going to know deep on the inside everything's going to be okay. Because this is the season that my life is in. If you don't recognize the season of your life, you'll stay confused and you won't have any joy and you will feel defeated. But if you can find out what season your life is in, it will help your focus. I've been, I feel like I'm in a focus, uh, in a survival season. But wait a minute, I'm really in a learning season. I just need to trust God. Does that make sense to you? So you've got to understand the season of your life. Is your focus, you know, all about uh, survival or is it all about learning? Or are you in an adolescent focus? Is it all about you? And that's a dangerous one to be in. I didn't expect any amens on that one. It's kind of what I, you know, you, 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 you do what you expect. So. If my focus is always me, I'm not going to see anything else but me. And when I see me, I know some of you look in the mirror and you're like, you sing how great thou art. How great thou art. <laughs> or, if you're like me, I mean, I'm not going to say that. If you're like me, you look at yourself and you look at all your issues. You look at all your weaknesses. How can God love me? Um, for you single people out there, this ain't a slam, but how can a woman ever love me? How could a man ever love me? This is why my parents didn't love me. Look at me. You see all your weaknesses. This is why I don't have any friends. Look at you. Come on. But then we get ourselves in that <laughs> state. And that <laughs> state steals your focus. And you begin to focus on your weakness. You begin to focus on your woe is me's and your schlep rock. I talked about schlep rock before. Wowzy, wowzy, woo, woo. You begin to focus on all of that stuff. And all you see is issues. Well, if that's all you see is issues, then that's all you're going to have. That's all you're going to have is issues. So if, if your focus is self, and then, then you have the other side of that, where people actually think they're better than who they are. And that's a scary place to be when people think there's something that they're really not. And to be honest with you, they're just insecure. And why we're on the topic of insecurity, let me talk about insecurity. Most people, when they're insecure, they overcompensate with cockiness. I see it in a lot of young men all the time. They just they overcompensate with cockiness and pride. Well, in reality, people like that, they're just insecure. I can do this. I can do that. When I was in high school, I wrestled five guys at one time. What do you want, a happy meal? I, I mean, guys. So y'all know what I'm saying? Y'all know what I'm saying? So there, there's the other side of self, and w when we're insecure, we overcompensate. That's how you can tell when somebody's really insecure, because they, they think they're good at everything, and they're not. But you don't want to hurt their feelings. Okay. It's the truth. And so our insecurities, and we're insecure because we don't know who we are. And I'm not throwing stones. Can I talk? Do I have permission to speak freely? Okay. That's why guys sometimes get hooked up with the wrong girls, and girls get hooked up with the wrong guys, because we're insecure. That's why sometimes in marriages, the wife runs everything because the man's so insecure, he doesn't know how to be the man. And so it takes the wife and puts her in the place where she isn't supposed to be. Now she's the dominant one because the guy ain't got no spine because he's insecure because he don't know who he is. 
And then you got the other guys on the other, uh, other end who think they're everything, and they wind up treating their family bad because they're insecure, because they're, now they're cocky. And they have their nice little job somewhere, and they have a nice little American house, but they don't know how to treat their family. But they'll come to church and raise their hand. Praise God. i got to praise God for you, buddy. It's, it's, it's insecurity. And when you allow insecurity to take root in your heart, you overcompensate one way or another, and it steals your focus. And when it steals your focus, and the enemy will play that, and when it steals your focus, then you can't become who God has really called you to be because you haven't really dealt with that insecurity. Ah, this is a Dr. Phil moment. So it's, it's like, and I've used this example a thousand trillion times, and, and you know, I'm an insecure guy. <laughs> That's kind of funny. Um, you wouldn't think so. Because the way that I was abused in second grade, uh, she stole my security. So I went through years and years of years of being afraid of people and being intimidated of people. I was always intimidated. You can't tell it now. I, I overcompensate probably. Uh, but, you know, I, people used to really in, in, in intimidate me. Preachers used to intimidate me. People with strong personalities used to intimidate me. Now I laugh at them because I know that they're just insecure. People used to intimidate me. Why? Because the secure security that I felt was taken from me at a young age and because that was supposed to be my filter because I told you before our parents and our teachers and uh, people the police officers and things in our you know adult figures are supposed to be our filter when we're young because that's how we learn but what if their filter screwed up my second grade teacher filter was screwed up because she was going through a nasty divorce and she decided to use Kelly Floyd as a target for her anger and for her dysfunction. And so that affected me. My filters right here, my parents right here were great filters. It's okay, Dad, be free. It's all good. Just be free in Jesus' name. There's no fear. Be, uh, yeah. <laughs> my, mom said, we would have had their heads on a platter. Uh, she actually had more than one head. I saw it. Um, <laughs> so... Just to let you know, they were great parents. They didn't know about it. I didn't tell them. I, it's all good. They didn't know. You're welcome. Jeez. Um, okay, calm down, Mom. It's okay. It's, it's over with. I'm 46 years old now. It's, it's, it's over with. I still liked it. No, I'm just kidding. But she stole my security. And so I went through life, and I'm still, okay, I'm just going to admit something here. The rabbit hole's getting deep, Lord. I need a vacation. Y'all that know me, I'm pretty apologetic. Does anybody catch that? I've had people. Shut up, Ben. I've had. Um, I'm just kidding. I've had people say, Pastor, man, you preach good, but why are you so apologetic? Uh, that's why. That's why. There's a root there, and I'm still dealing with that root, Jamie. How old, what are you in second grade, seven years old? I'm still dealing with that root. So it's still there. I have to deal with it. And so it comes out of me as apologetic sometimes. Those of you that know me, I'm, I'm like, I'm sorry. Are you okay? I'm sorry. Are you okay? I'm sorry. Are you okay? I'm sorry, Kayla. I didn't mean to talk about your hair being bad. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> so creepy. Um, what would you tell me, Lauren, Sunday night? What would you say? You're so weird, but I love it. <laughs> I know, but that was the dinosaur hands, I think. Okay. So, um, I'm still dealing with that part of my life that hasn't been healed. And to be honest with you, I don't know if it will ever fully get healed, but it can be managed. Can we be real? I, I think, <laughs> I, I think that some of us Christians think that, God's just going to take everything away. And I think that in some cases, he, he will heal you. But you still have to deal with your soul. I told you before, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, your spirit, because there's three parts to you, spirit, soul, body, your spirit is reborn. Okay, But your soul that, ha that holds your mind, your will, your ability to choose, okay, your emotions, your feelings, 
that's a process of being saved. And being saved means to be rescued. I still can see at 46, almost 47 years old, my birthday is April 13th, everybody remember. I want a lot of stuff. Uh, yep. What was I saying? Okay. I still, at almost 47 years old, April 13th, I can still see her face. Mad. Screaming. I can still see her face. Why? Because it's not healed. Be Dad? Calm down. <laughs> They're still fighting for me. <laughs> Rebuke that. Rebuke myself. I still see it. Okay? If I really think hard enough, I can go back there. Why? Because it's my soul. Y'all getting it? So there's some things in your life that you may not totally, totally ever be free of. You can get a healing, but the memory. Now, when I think about her, I'm not angry anymore. I play around with it, but really I'm not. I'm more concerned. I, you know, it makes me sad for her. Because that's what grace and mercy does from God in your life. I'm more sad for her. I want her to be healed. And God, God has been healing me of that for a long, long time. But the memory of it is still there. So I'm healed of the situation. But the memory is still there. And you've got to learn some things. You've got to discern. When everybody say discern. You've got to discern what is it a legitimate hurt or what is a memory. Because if you don't understand the difference between the two... The enemy will take hold of that and allow that memory to be your focus. In reality, it's not hurt anymore because God's healed you. But the, see, the enemy, the devil is the, is the accuser of the brethren. So he will accuse you and he will bring stuff up from your past in reality that God's probably healed you of some things. But the memory's still fresh. God needs to heal you of the memory. So I still have the memory of it. It's like, okay, it's like... Uh, my accident in 2010 in the Philippines, my motorcycle accident. Four of my ribs were broken in half, punctured lung. Um, I almost died twice on the operating table, crash cart outside of, my, uh, outside of my room. They were checking on me every hour. My blood pressure would drop. They almost, almost coded twice. Almost died. Okay? That memory of that accident is fresh in my mind. I can still smell it. I, I was in that field that day, 120 degrees in the Philippines, and you know the, the sky was overcast and it was lightly raining, and I had blood coming all down the side of my face, had a gash in my head filling up my eye, I had a cut in my shoulder, I couldn't breathe. Uh, I remember the ride vaguely, it kept passing out, but vaguely is basically the hospital. I, rem I remember things. Uh, I, I, I remember the great young Filipino nurses that would come in, the male nurses and female nurses, they would come in, hello, sir, you okay? Hello, sir, you need something? Hello, sir, hello, sir, hello, sir, hello, sir. Rice, 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 rice. No, I don't want any more rice. <laughs> Sorry, I went away for a while. Um, <laughs> I, I, still, I still remember the, 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 the impact that I hit on the ground that day. I hit on my head and it hit on my left side of my body and rolled over and took my helmet off and blood and I, I, the, the, the memory is very fresh but the wounds are healed now I still have a scar in my chest where they did surgery I have a scar in my shoulder where some of the earth like took part of my shoulder out from the accident I remember it I still have the scars but deep down inside I'm healed and that's important I know that I'm healed but I still have the memory if you're not careful, what the enemy will do to your life is he will allow that memory to push on you if you do not govern yourself. Hear me. Now this is good teaching tonight. He will allow the memory to push on you so much that it will become a distraction and that's all you focus on, the memory. And he will dupe you into thinking that you're not healed. But you've got to understand, just because you have the memory... And, and you can smell the situations. It doesn't mean that you're still hurting from that. Does that make sense? Because you'll just know. I know. I have the memory of my abuse in second grade, but I know I'm healed. Now, I got to deal with some issues to this day because of it. That doesn't mean I'm not healed. That doesn't mean that that thing has me chained up. It means I have authority over that thing. That I understand that I can cast that. I can cast that thought down. That's not who I am. That's not who I am. It's not me. That's not me. That's what happened to me. And that's another thing. Something that has happened to you doesn't mean that that's who you are. That's just what happened to you. And you've got to discern between the two. Is it, is it the memory? Is it the hurt? And God, and there's no easy answer tonight. 
But, but you know, you, you, the Holy Spirit will guide you and lead you and help you to understand. Okay, I really have been healed, but I, that, that memory is still there. Well, you've got to govern yourself. You've got to know who you are. Mm-hmm. And sometimes the hurt that we experience pushes on us, and it pushes on us, and it pushes on us, and it's not fair. Well, who said life was fair? And you can't control what other people do, but you can control what you do. Life isn't what happens to you. It's how you respond to what happens to you. You can't control what other people do. And you can absorb and you can absorb and you're going to have a bad day and you can have a bad five, ten years. But I'm telling you, we serve a God that is eternal. And his love knows no boundaries. And he will take you from here and move you and move you and build in you and change you and heal you and get you here. You still may remember at this level what you were then. But that doesn't mean that's who you are now. Ah, come on. You know who you are in Christ. You know, you, I am a new creation. I'm a new creation. And when I begin to feel insecure, and when I begin to feel intimidated by people because of what I walk through, no, I'm a new creation. That doesn't mean they're better than me. I'm not going to live my life at a low level. I'm not going to be prideful or cocky about it. I'm going to stay humble, but I'm going to know who I am. A song we do. I know who I am. I know who I am. I know who I am. I am yours. You are mine. I said that wrong. But you are mine. There it is. Where's Missy? Jesus, you are mine. Uh, Let me think of the song. Hold on. I'm trying to make a point. And I feel good singing right now. It doesn't last long. I was running when you found me. I mean, that your past is not your future. I was running when you found me. I was blind, and you gave me sight. You put a song of praise in me. Is that right, Dustin? Whoa, whoa. I was broken, and you healed me. I was dying, and you gave me life. Listen, Lord, you are my identity, and I know. Love this part. I know. I know, I know, I know who I am. See, when you know who you are in Jesus, I remember when I was broken, but he healed me. I still remember the brokenness, but he healed me. I still remember the fear, but he healed me. I still remember my accident, but I'm healed of my accident. I still got scars. And you know what the scars are? The scars are not so much a reminder of the brokenness. The scars are there to tell you that you've been healed. If they weren't healed, then you wouldn't have the scar. Uh, scars can remind you. Scars in your life can be like memorials. I'm preaching now. Scars can be like memorials in your life to tell you what God brought you through. So a scar doesn't have to be a bad thing. It can just remind you, you know what? I went through hell, but I'm alive. They said I wasn't going to make it, but I'm here. Yeah. Don't be confused by the memory and the hurt. Amen. Let God heal you. Know who you are. Don't let things distract you and steal your destiny. No, you got to live for your destiny. you got to invest your life. We had a discipleship class this past Sunday night. And we're going to do some things a little differently because I had to fly through stuff and people couldn't keep up. We're, we're going to work on that after Easter. So y'all be patient. Don't be discouraged. We still had fun with it. But we're going to slow it down a little bit. I'd rather, I'd rather you get it. You know, I'd rather not even finish a lesson as long as you could get what we could give you. We had 42 people. No, because it's Easter, holiday, Christian holiday. Jesus didn't even die in April. Anyway, um, humans. Um, (laughs) My dog says that to me all the time, humans. Why are you talking to me like I'm a baby for? I'm 112. How we do that with dogs? Hi, little buddy. Hi, your girl. Hi, my girl. And you're like, I'm 112 years old. Why are you talking to me like that for? We talk to our children the same way we talk to our dogs. Hi, you, 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 you. Hi, you good girl. Hi, you, you, you. Come on. And they're like, they have no clue, but it makes us feel better. Why am I saying that? I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> Maybe it was her fault I got ADD. I, Let's get back on track. Y'all ready? Everybody okay? Can y'all flow with me? That's what I thought. Can y'all flow with me? 
So the focus of infancy is survival. Jesse, we're doing the class next, the following Sunday, the 7th. Pastor Scott Fraser will be with us that morning as well. I'm going to make him sit in the class because he needs to learn something. The focus of infancy is survival. The focus of childhood is learning. The focus of adolescence is self. The focus of maturity is reproduction. Now, if you're walking through some of these focuses, it doesn't mean it's a bad thing. You just need to know what season your life is in. And sometimes you need to focus on yourself. Lauren, what's Austin always say? Okay, let's do it. Uh, ch check yourself before you wreck yourself. Yeah? Where is he? Check yourself before you wreck yourself. Yeah? Sometimes you need to go through a season of self. That doesn't mean you keep everybody out. I'm in that season right now. I'm trying to be. I'm trying to take care, care of Kelly. If I don't take care of Kelly, because I got side, sidetracked a little bit. If I don't take care of Kelly, I can't take care of my wife. I can't take care of my son, even though he's 20 freaking years old. I, I, can't, I can't take care of my church. If Kelly isn't fixed in some areas, and Kelly don't take some time for Kelly, I can't be good for anybody else. It's like when you're on an airplane, and they say if the pressure drops and the gas max, gas mask, thank you, um, oxygen mask falls, um, put it on yourself, then the child. Because if you don't take care of you, the child's going to die. Does that make sense to you? So sometimes it's good to go through a season of self, but not a prideful, cocky thing and everybody, you're mad at everybody. It's not like, a, a, it's not like well, it's about me, it's about me. No, it's about, no, i got to help me. And sometimes the best way to help you is to give. Is to give. So sometimes you, need to, you just need to recognize the season. Look at your neighbor and say, i got to recognize the season. Yeah, i got to recognize the season. Get this, your life is a seed. Your life is a seed that God has planted in the earth. Okay, your life is a seed that God has planted in the earth. And the time in history that you are born into, listen, the time in history that you are born into, can you know that there's a reason why that you weren't born in 1755? Dad was, but the rest of us weren't. <laughs> I'm just kidding. There's a... Just kidding. You know. There's a reason why you weren't born in 1755. There's a reason why you weren't born in the year 2415. Okay? I was born in 1984. Okay, I was kidding. I was born in 1966. There is a reason why I was born in that time. There's a reason why you were born at that time. So the time in history, listen, the time in history that you were born into demands your existence in the earth. The time in history that you were born into, it demands your existence, and it demands your passion. It demands your hope. It demands your faith. Do you realize that there are people waiting on you? There are people that need to come to Christ. There are people that need hope in their life that you can interact with daily and daily. You know, there's a young man that came to church on Sunday that Lauren said, you know what, I go to the church there in the corner. He came into her shop. I don't know if you did his hair or whatever, but he came to church, and he came up to me after church, tears in his eyes. Tears in his eyes, because at first he was real standoffish. You know, standoffish. Is that German? That's a good word, stand, standoffish. He was real standoffish. And he was real kind of hard. But after church, he had tears in his eyes. And he came up to me, he's like, I've been out of church for seven years. Wow. That's awesome, Lauren. Well, well, we have a little bar out there. We have coffee on it. It's a scene. Um, <laughs> but he came to me. He said, you know what? I have been in church for seven years. I'm new here, and I needed this, and I will be back. I will be back. What if Lauren hadn't said anything to him? All she said, well, you know, I go to the church now. You should come. So you don't know that the Bible says that we are to be salt and light. Salt and light is influence. Can I put some pressure on you without you feel guilty? When's the last time you witnessed to somebody? When's the last time you shared the gospel? No, I've been in, I've been in an adolescent stage. Yeah, I know. Okay. Okay, it demands your passion. And really it demands your focus to be right. 
It demands your focus to be right. Man, I really, it's 8 o'clock. Can I finish? Okay, yeah, we can finish. <laughs> Whitney, Jamie said we could do it. Go to Acts 13. Can we go there, Scott? We're almost done. Can you guys give me five minutes? Just five minutes. We'll, we'll rush through it, and we'll see what God does. I'm going to take up offering and go to Skyline or something. Acts 13, chapter 36. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep, was buried with his fathers, and saw corruption. Okay, this is important. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep. So he served his generation, okay, and by the will of God, by the will of God, he served his generation, he fell asleep. That means he died. Okay, his life on earth was over. He was buried with his fathers and saw corruption. That word corruption means his body decayed. Okay, you know, The Walking Dead. You watch Walking Dead, that's what happens. Your body decays and you're a zombie. Okay, but, but he who, just kidding, that's just Hollywood. But he who uh, God raised up saw no corruption. Okay, we'll just stop right, we, we, uh, yeah, we'll just stop right there. But he who God raised up saw no, who did God raise up? He's talking about Jesus. So Jesus, Jesus served not only his generation, but Jesus served every generation and didn't see corruption. David served his own generation. We need to serve our generations. That's what Lauren did. I don't know the ages, but don't split hairs with me. That's what, um, that's what, split hairs, get it, your hairdresser. That's what, um, that's what, uh, that's what Lauren did. She served her generation by talking to that young man. But, but Jesus served every generation. So we should serve our generation, and we should serve every generation, generation, sillies, silly wabbits. That's why what Whitney and Jason's doing with the kids right now is, is so important because they're serving that generation. Not only are they not serve, are they serving that generation, but they're serving their own generation. So we need to we need to serve and understand our call in the earth. We need to serve generations. Now, when you get into generations, there's some things that can stop us from gener from from serving generations. I'm going to rush through this because I want you to get it. There is what we call a generational curse. It's a generational curse. Now. A generational curse is a problem that is passed through the bloodlines of our fathers, mothers, grandparents, great-great-grandparents, whatever. It's a, it's a dysfunctional generational curse that comes down through the bloodline that's natural. It's a generational curse. So uh, that's why, well, my, my, my great-grandfather was an alcoholic, so I am. My dad was an alcoholic, so I am. Okay, well, that's probably a generational curse issue. There's some sexual sins that are passed down from fathers to sons, fathers to sons, mothers to daughters. Okay, there's a generational curses. There's ways of thinking. There's ways of thinking that are passed down. Okay, yeah, I'm not going to finish this tonight. There's, there's ways of thinking that are passed down that we get. Okay, uh, mom, I'm going to tell on you. This is not a curse, but I, I, I get, <laughs> we were good parents. Um. Why do you sound like the? Okay, okay, um, okay. I get, I got a Superman complex. I want to fix everybody, and when I can't, I get upset. I get that from her. See, <laughs> mom soak in, soaks in everybody's problem to the point to where it wears her out. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Dad. Everybody doesn't even know that. Just make sure. Um, <laughs> okay, I do the same thing. So it's a way of thinking that I've inherited. And she got it from somebody. Does that make sense? Okay, I've just used that as an example. It's not that much. It's not a curse, but some days it can be. Um, okay, but so there's ways of thinking that might get you all in trouble. And if you think about it, maybe your mom is that way. Maybe your daddy's that way. Maybe your great grandparent. You know what I'm talking about. So, so uh, we're we're gonna have to get into this next Wednesday. Okay, let me tell you one more thing. Then there's a generational spirit. Okay, and are you spiritual people really like this one? There's a generational spirit. It's a spirit that is assigned to render a generation powerless. Okay? And rob them of their purpose. Okay? I got more to say, but we're going to have to make this next week. Okay? So there's generational curses, and then there's a generational spirit. Y'all do know. Y'all want a matrix moment? Matrix moment where you see reality? Here's the deal. I don't know. All you people who get what I'm getting ready to say, don't say amen. Because I want it to hang out there for a little bit. This world and this country, over areas of the United States, 
in different parts, there are what there's called, is, is there's natural territory, there is spiritual territories, okay? And there's demon spirits that are assigned to different territories. We know this to be true from the book of Daniel. Daniel prayed to God, okay? The angel, as soon as he prayed, God sent the angel to give him the answer. But the Bible says that the angel came into contact with the prince of Persia. Persia was the area, not the video game, okay? Persia was the area. The prince of Persia was a demon spirit. When the angel came down to give Daniel his answer, they began to fight. And the fight got so fierce he, had, fierce, he had to go get Michael, the archangel, to finish the battle for him while he brought the answer to Daniel. Daniel waited and waited and waited. If you don't get to your answer right away, it's because there might be a battle going on. And if you don't understand the things of the spirit, our society bows to that prince. It's over in northern Kentucky. We bow to it. And we get carnal. And we live under that. When all of a sudden you feel like you have no joy, your, bow, your soul is bowing to that, that prevalent spirit. It's okay. It's not Ghost Hunters International. Everything's okay. The cool thing is, is when you begin to recognize what it is, you can fight it. And you fight it in the, in the things of the spirit, not through yourself. I wish sometimes we could fight naturally because I'd want to rip his head off. But I'm a little guy, and I just got a big bark. Okay, but we fight in the spirit. So when depression is pushing on you, most of the time, it's probably, if it's not a generational curse, it's a spirit. If you have the joy of Jesus Christ in you and depression's all over you, get it off of you. You don't bow to it. You're in a war. Yeah, we're going to have to end. Ah. But there's, there's spirits over this territory. I'm not looking at Dustin I'm lo or Scott. I'm looking at the clock. Um, Dustin's like, Pastor, what did I do? I'm just sitting here listening. And why do you say I talk? I don't sound like that when I talk. <laughs> Pastor, why are you looking at me like that for? <laughs> it, there's, a, there's a spirit that's over this side of the nation. Now, if you go to Reno, okay, where Austin is right now, around that, the West Coast, it's a different feeling in the atmosphere. It's a different fit. Right there, it's just kind of wild and crazy. Here, it's very, there's religious, very religious spirits here. That's why we're so denominational held. And we can't take communion with you because you're not in our little religious club. Don't get me started. So it's that religious spirit, and it tries to push down on you. Now, when we lived on the West Coast, we would pray. Have you ever, we would pray, and we felt like we were praying into a pillow. Have you ever prayed that way? You're praying, and there's no breakthrough. For some of you that, that are into prayer, you're praying, there's no breakthrough. Ah, well, that's not when you stop. That's when you push on. What's the Bible say? A fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Sometimes you've got to get fervent. You've got to rub it hot. You've got to pray through until you get the victory. You don't stop. Sometimes we feel that here, but it's a religious thing, so you push through it. Amen. We've got to give offering, and we've got to go. Can I talk about this more next Wednesday? Will you all come? If we talk about generational stuff and generational spirits and all that, you all want to get into that? Yeah, it'll be fun. Yeah? All right, let's do it. Let me pray. Father, thank you. Lord, I got sidetracked tonight a little bit, but I want, to, to, I want them to understand the things that steal our focus and what we're focusing on and why. Because we've got to become everything you've called us to be. Mm -hmm. We've got to become everything you've called us to be. I must live for my destiny. I must live for purpose. I must become everything you've called me to be. My destiny is to become everything you've called me to be. And when I'm doing my destiny, i got to learn how to stay in the lane, stay in the game. And God, I thank you for your grace. Help us all. Open up our eyes to see, ears to hear, minds to perceive, and we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen.